Good morning, Order. This is the Senate Environmental Natural Resource Finance Committee call to order. It being the sixth day of February uh, 2022, this is our first meeting. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, first of all, we're going to start out with introductions. Uh, those that may or may not know me, I'm uh, Chair Bill Ingebretson, uh, and we'll go right on down the list on your left hand side of the agenda. So we'll start out with Carrie and we'll just go right on down because we do have some new members. Sure. Okay. Taurus, Senator Ray, Taurus Ray, are you there? Okay, now you can hear me. Senator Taurus Ray. Are you with us? Well, we'll go to, maybe we're not quite set up yet. I think I'm fine, but nobody's talking to me. <laughs> Senator Eaton, are you there? Okay, we're going to see what's going on. We're going to introduce the folks at the table here right away. Uh, really, the only, the only new person here is uh, Jesse McArdle, my committee administrator. So why don't you go introduce yourself and uh, give, them, give them the experience you have here in, the, uh, in state government, and we'll go through the, to the rest of them. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, Jesse McArdle here. I'm the uh, new CA for the uh, Senate Environment and Natural Resources Committee, as well as the uh, Mining and Forestry Committee. So very pleased to be with you all. And thank you all for being here. And uh, just ask that you bear with us as we uh, start navigating this uh, new waters here with the uh, hybrid format. <laughs> Senator Tomasoni's here. Welcome, Dave. <laughs> You can't hear anybody? Can you hear me? Okay. Well, we'll just go more, move right along then. Uh, Vice Chair Senator Rude, I, I think, is right. I can't hear you either, okay. Senator Ingebrigtsen. All right, we're going to try and get this figured out. I do. Uh, Senator Kerry Rood, um, Senate District 10, all of Aiken and Crow Wing County. I chair the Environment uh, and Natural Resources Policy and Legacy Finance Committee. Did you hear, did you hear Senator Rood? Senator Eaton? No. We're going to try one more thing here. Are you able to hear? Are you able to hear? I do, but it's really echoey. Is that her? Still have an echo. Okay, that's good.
Are we still? Are we still? Is that better? Still echo? No, no echo. Okay. Uh, Senator Eaton, you're our contact right now. Can you hear us in the other world? <laughs> Can anybody hear us that's, that's remote? Now, can anybody hear us? Senator Eaton? That is perfect. Thank you. Okay, there we are. I think we're going to start from the top. I'm going to call the order of the, uh, the uh, Senate Environmental Natural Resource Finance Committee, Tuesday, uh, February, February 8th. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, as you can see, we're, uh, we're getting through the bugs uh, of the uh, world we're living in right now, at least temporarily. You're going to notice some members are not here, but they are going to be remote, uh, so they will be as they are sitting here. Uh, we'll start out with introductions. Uh, uh, I'm the chair of the committee, Senator Ingerbritson, and from there we'll go to Senator Rudin. Right on down the line, if everybody has an agenda in front of them, please speak up and identify yourself. Senator Rood. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Kerry Rood, Senate District 10, all of Aiken and Crow Wing County, and I chair the Environment and Natural Resources Policy and Legacy Finance Committee. Ranking member, Taurus Ray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am Patricia Torres Ray. I represent District 63, and I'm happy to be here today starting this session. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Senator Lang. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Andrew Lang, Senate District 17. I'm uh, Southwest Minnesota. I represent all of four counties uh, except two townships. And uh, I am uh, heavily involved in ag and environment and uh, the chair of veterans. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Justin Eichhorn, Grand Rapids, Itasca, Cass, Beltrami counties. Uh, I serve as the vice chair of the Education Committee. Uh, I serve as the chair of the Mining and Forestry Policy Committee. Uh, I'm also on this and just got added to Commerce. So happy to be here, happy to start talking about the issues that are important for our district. So thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. And Senator Tomasoni, we know you're here. Uh, in fact, you were the first one here. So welcome. Welcome back to the committee. Thank you. <coughs> David Tomasoni, I am a <clears throat> from Senator Singh, and I represent the Army. All right. We'll move on to Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Senator Chris Eaton. I represent Senate District 40 and um, Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park, and I also am one of the co chairs of the subcommittee on water legislation. Thank you. And Senator Dibble, uh, who is also a member, is not present today, I'm being told. We'll go on to the, uh, one of the newbies here, uh, committee administ new committee administrator, uh, Jesse. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, Jesse McArdle, new uh, committee administrator for uh, Senate's Environment and Natural Resources Finance, as well as the uh, Mining and Forestry Policy Committees. Uh, thank you all for being with us this morning and just ask that uh, you bear with us here as we kind of uh, navigate these new waters with the re our, uh, hybrid hearing uh, structure. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I'm Will Wagner. I'm the committee legislative assistant for Senator Ingebrigtsen. This is my third session with the Environment Committee. Mr. Stanley, are you there? 
Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Uh, good morning, members. I'm Ben Stanley, uh, Committee Council. Next up, we have Dan Mueller. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dan Mueller. I'm the fiscal analyst for the Environment Committee. Also, I serve as a fiscal analyst on the Housing Committee, but uh, for here, I'm the fiscal analyst on the Environment Committee. And I think Laura's here. Yes, I am, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Laura Pager. I'm the Legislative Analyst for the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. I also work on the Agriculture Committee. And we also have research, Ali and Cassie. Are they on? Uh, yep, Cassie Talbert all here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am the DFL researcher for um, environment. Welcome. Okay. Allie Eilers, I am the research researcher for the Senate SRC for the committee. Well, thank you um, uh, for those introductions. And, and uh, it's always have, nice to have everybody at least in touch with what's going on here at the meeting. We're only missing one member. Uh, so uh, I, th I guess for the first day and our first uh, day of, of uh, going with the technology here uh, and not in person, I think we're, we're uh, it's a pretty successful day. But we'll, uh, we're going to move right on here because we are cramped up a little time here. So we're, we're going to start out uh, with the overview from the Department of Natural Resources Supplemental Budget Request. And I think uh, Commissioner Sarah Stroman, you come forward and identify yourself and welcome to the committee. Senator Torres Ray, I'm sorry, you have your hand up. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to make sure uh, members and the staff know that attending this meeting are my new legislative assistant, uh, Irene, who is connected, and uh, Gabrielle, who is also an intern for my office, and uh, he will be working with us for the session, and his passion is uh, environmental policy. So I encourage him to attend this meeting today and get to know you, the members of the committee, and particularly these presentations that uh, will be made by um, members of the different uh, agencies. So uh, I just wanted to introduce them and uh, you know Good. encourage members to connect with them when they need to. Well, welcome thank to you. welcome to them and thank you. And Senator Dibble, I understand you're uh, you're online. If you could introduce yourself. Yes. Great. Thank you, uh, everyone. I'm uh, State Senator Scott Dibble, and um, I represent uh, a part of Minneapolis, and um, uh, super happy to be on this committee and uh, love all things related to keeping our environment uh, clean and preserving it. Um, what else? Anything, anything else in my assignment, Mr. Chair? <laughs> We're actually running a little behind time, and that, that will do for now. I appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Great. Thanks. So, Commissioner Stroman, welcome again to the committee. Mr. Chairman and members, thank you very much. Um, for the record, my name is Sarah Stroman. I am the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Uh, also here with me today is our Assistant Commissioner, Bob Meyer, and our uh, Chief Financial Officer, Mary Robison. And, uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to be here today uh, in this room with you to talk about the Walls Flanagan budget to move Minnesota forward and uh, in particular the, the supplemental budget. Um, Mr. Chair, I am going to just touch briefly uh, in addition to the supplemental budget on the bonding piece. Um, I know this is not the Capital Investment Committee, but I think it is important for uh, this committee to understand how the bonding uh, proposal and the supplemental budget uh, work together. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chair, I think just uh, as far as introduction, um, I, I do want to say that uh, as we talked about last session, this really is a remarkable time uh, for the DNR and, and for Minnesota. Uh, with the COVID pandemic, we've seen Minnesotans turn to the outdoors in really large numbers for um, safe and healthy activities, but also for uh, relief from the stress and anxiety. 
And uh, as we talked about last session, those opportunities have been there for Minnesotans because of investment we've made in the past. And we really are due for another round of significant investment to make sure that those same opportunities are available for Minnesotans uh, going forward. And with the historic budget surplus, we really have a unique uh, opportunity for one-time investment in our natural resources and outdoor recreation that support the work that the DNR does on behalf of Minnesotans. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to report, and I'm just gonna cover bonding um, briefly, that the Move Minnesota Forward Local Jobs and Projects or Bonding Proposal includes $221.4 million for the DNR. This amounts to approximately 11% of the total proposal that the governor has put forward. The largest uh, element of that proposed bonding investment is $110 million. Uh, that is to take care of our existing assets, including buildings, water and wastewater systems, roads, trails, bridges, public water access sites, and water control structures. Uh, the proposal also includes significant investments in modernizing, expanding, or developing facilities that support natural resource management and outdoor recreation. Um, and again, at, at the end here, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how those investments dovetail with the investments in the supplemental budget uh, to make a whole package. Uh, but what we want to focus on now is the um, budget to move Minnesota forward, the supplemental budget piece. Um, there is a total of $95.4 million in that supplemental budget proposal for the DNR, primarily in the areas of climate change and drought relief. And so what you see uh, here in front of you is our uh, summary of the climate investments uh, in that proposal. Thank you. Most notably, uh, there is $42 million for climate investments in natural lands and waters, including modernizing, enhancing DNR managed assets and restoring streams to mitigate and adapt to climate change impacts. And you'll see all of those summarized uh, there on the front page of, um, of the, the fact sheet, uh, including the $13 million to complete high priority stream restorations, $10 million to rehabilitate and reconfigure public water accesses to make them more resilient to climate impacts and add aquatic invasive species prevention and stormwater management features. $10 million to modernize and adapt fish hatcheries so they can support healthy uh, and climate adapted fisheries into the future. $8 million to address current and future climate change driven flooding impacts to state parks, roads and trails and $1 million to restore native plant communities in state parks. Additionally, this proposal includes uh, $24 million for the acquisition of public lands to support recreation and conservation, ultimately decreasing the state's net greenhouse gas emissions. It also includes $10 million for enhancing grass grasslands and restoring wetlands on wildlife management areas, and $5.5 million for private forest management to accelerate technical assistance and cost share to private woodland owners. Um, in addition to these uh, climate investments, the package also includes $13.35 million in drought investments. Uh, you should have a separate fact sheet on the drought relief um, investments. These include uh, programs to address uh, mortality of trees lost to drought, both in terms of seedlings uh, on DNR and uh, other public and private lands, as well as community um, reforestation efforts, uh, water conservation grants for municipal and other local water suppliers, and uh, funding for individual and small community well interference. What I would like to focus a little bit on now is the, the full picture of how the investments in that drought package in the climate package and in the bonding package add up to a total investment again to make sure that we are uh, providing those outdoor experiences and uh, conservation of our natural resources that Minnesotans uh, so greatly value. So for example, um, in total, uh, between the, the bonding and the, the supplemental package, there's a $26 million investment in land and water restoration. So for example, that includes the stream restoration, the grasslands and wetlands restoration, and the native uh, plant restoration in state parks. There is a $40.5 million, $40 million investment in state lands infrastructure, 
Um, examples include the Lake Vermilion State Park uh, development plan, uh, enhancing accessibility for uh, people with disabilities in our state parks and wildlife management areas, new shower buildings at state parks. There's a $20 million total investment proposed for our public water access sites. We know how important uh, these are to the boating public. Uh, Minnesota is, uh, has a very high number of uh, boat owners and our public water access infrastructure is, is quite dated and not uh, well suited to uh, today's uh, habits, today the number of uh, watercraft that are operating nor uh, the impacts we're seeing of lakes, uh, lake levels rising and uh, falling. And then finally, there's a $22 million investment in fishing infrastructure. That includes uh, $20 million for our hatchery system, which as we know is incredibly important to uh, maintain our, our angling uh, public uh, experience and the quality and diversity of fisheries that we have in Minnesota. And then there's $2 million in that for shore fishing opportunities. So Mr. Chair, I will just uh, conclude this overview by saying uh, we recognize this is an ambitious budget and uh, we believe that's as it should be. Really, it's an indication uh, of the importance these of our, these investments to our ability to serve Minnesotans. These, these investments will allow us to advance the DNR's mission and address critical issues such as climate change, improving access to the outdoors, and rehabilitating aging and in some cases failing infrastructure. These investments uh, in our natural resources and outdoor experiences we know also benefit Minnesota's communities and our, the economy of those communities and our quality of life throughout the state. And Mr. Chair, uh, we are happy to stand for any questions that members of the committee may have. Thank you, Commissioner, for that report and, and uh, request. I've got several questions, uh, and maybe either yourself or, or Mr. Meyer can answer. I'm looking at dam safety. Does that include dam restoration? Um, I know there's some, some s small dams out there that are uh, built before the beginning of time that are, are having some troubles. Is this, is this enough money to cover for dam restoration or Explain the dam safety for me. Mr. Chair, I'm assuming you're looking at the dam safety line in the bonding proposal. Yeah. Um, yep, that is a typical um, program or line item for us in the bonding proposal. It is allows us to address the dams uh, that are of most uh, significant priority in terms of needs of, of fixing in the state. So. Uh, we can we can get you a list uh, our dam safety rating of of which would be the top priorities. I, I would like that as well as okay the uh, um, hatcheries now hatcheries has been and some of them have been deteriorating for years and and uh, was we re received a report some years ago about that and I'm wondering uh, is this going to be enough to actually uh, this request enough to to pick them all up and get them all running properly and up to today's standards, would you say? Mr. Chair, according um, to the feasibility study uh, that's been done on our hatchery system in totality, I believe the total need is about $58 million in terms of that total need. Again, we, we, our needs are so great, we can't address them all in a single year or a single bonding proposal. And so we, um, as, as I think the committee's aware, uh, have a 10-year uh, plan that we follow for that. So this $20 million for hatcheries, it's $10 million in the bonding proposal, $10 million in general fund supplemental budget, uh, will allow us to address the most urgent critical needs, particularly at the Waterville, Waterville. hatchery. Okay. Yeah. That was going to be my question. Yep. And the last one that I have, and then I'll move on to others, is uh, Lake Vermilion was purchased some years ago, as you know, during the Palenti, actually, the Palenti administration and, and uh, development plan, uh, where are we with that? And, and, and how long before we, I mean, I should know this. I, I, should, I have not been up there since the time we looked at it when we were purchasing it. Uh, has there been a lot done? And, and how much more has to be done in order to make that a, a workable park? Mr. Chair, um, 
Thank you for that question, and we certainly would invite you to come and see uh, the progress that's been made up there. It really is a, a unique uh, landscape and a unique opportunity for Minnesotans to experience uh, that part of our state. Uh, I think the first uh, piece to open was a, a day use area. Um, so that's been in use for, I don't know, um, Bob, a couple of, several years now. Um, there is a campground that is open. I know it is full much of the time, and it's, it's wonderful to see folks not only up there camping, but they have their boats with them because it's a unique opportunity to access the lake. And then uh, last year we opened camper cabins uh, that are, are very uh, unique and uh, situated into the landscape there. This next proposal would be for the next phase of development, and specifically it would be for the visitor center and the campground south of Highway 169. So, so this is planning money only? No, this would be to uh, develop those amenities. Okay. Members, any questions so far? Senator Tomasoni. The visitor commission was most damn Did you understand me? I have my certificate. The question he asked is what about dam management? Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, Senate, Senator Tomasoni, um, the, the dam management would fall primarily in the bonding proposal uh, for that dam safety line item. And Assistant Commissioner Meyer, I'm looking for that number in front of me. Um, eight million dollars for dam safety repair reconstruction or removal and i am uh, wondering about the managing for levels of lakes i'm wondering about the managing for levels of lakes Mr. Chairman, Senator Tomasoni, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, the, the funds that we would use to manage those dams after they're constructed, rehabilitated, or removed would come from a different source that would not be in the bonding. Um, we can circle back with you and have a conversation about management or maintaining of existing structures that may, structures that may be developed in the bonding yeah. bill. I know we're working with Senator Eichhorn. Um, on, a, on an issue, and, and I believe it's adjacent to your district as well, on Canisteo Mine Pit, that there is some, some funds that would be needed to operate that and maintain that structure into the future. Senator Tomasoni, uh, he'll, he'll, see, he'll, he'll circle back with you on that? Yeah. Does that yes. Suffice? Does that suffice? Yeah. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. He, he didn't answer my question. He did? No. no. Oh, he didn't answer my question. Uh, okay. I will, I will circle back with him. He said I'll circle back with him. Thank you. Any other questions, members? Senator Lang. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess uh, oh, I was just kind of going through, through some of these, and I guess this is a general question for uh, anybody at the table, but uh, drought response. I mean, I guess the, the four and a half million uh, for Relief Minnesota replacing that, that stuff kind of makes sense. I'm curious about the well interferences. Can you, can you clarify that a little bit? There wasn't a whole lot of it in the handout um, that I saw. What's a well interference? Mr. Chair Commissioner. and Senator Lang um, and Assistant Commissioner Meyer can, can jump in here. But sometimes what we see, and, and we did have um, some of these cases last summer during the drought, is there actually will be a, a physical conflict between uh, two, different well, two different well users. And so there's a question then of right, uh, priority for that water. And you know, state statute dictates to the DNR who gets priority use of the water. A lot of times those conflicts can be resolved, but 
it helps to have a pool of money so that it's not solely the burden of, of those individuals who are affected on very short notice and uh, beyond their control. So that's what this pot of money is for, is to help resolve some of those well interferences. So if someone's well needs to go a little bit deeper or you know something else needs to be dug, that's what that funding is for. So for example, Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For example, like a local municipality or are we talking irrigators? Commissioner. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator Lang, we are talking small water suppliers. These would not be large water users and, or they could be individuals. Okay. I'm sorry, Commissioner, did you say irrigators? I said individuals, individual uh, water, domestic water users. The, the, point, the point of this funding is to make sure that no one runs out of a domestic water supply. Um, and, and then uh, a couple of general questions, and, the, and this is, relates, Mr. Chair, uh, directly kind of to, because this isn't normally how we get a budget, you know, the one sheet and then the one pamphlet. It's a little different than normal. So uh, one thing that's, you know, definitely missing that I, that I always look at is the FTEs. So in this budget proposal, do you have FTEs? Are they temporary? Are they permanent employees? Commissioner. Mr. Chair and, and Senator Lang, yes, uh, we do. And I would ask uh, Mary Robison to provide, she can provide that information to the committee. Okay. Is she here? She is. <laughs> Ms. Robinson, welcome to, the, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself, please. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Mary Robison, Chief Financial Officer for the DNR. Um, I apologize, but I'll need just a minute to look up the FTE information. If you have other questions, could I come back to that sure. question for you? Thank you. And then I'll make Mr. Meyer walk back to the table. <laughs> <laughs> Either way is fine with me. Uh, again, a little out of the ordinary for uh, getting a budget in this way, but you know, this is a topic of conversation we've had for the last couple of years about increasing license fees. Uh, Game and Fish Fund, I think, had a $5 million deficit coming into the next budgetary cycle. Um, I don't see that on the budget request. Uh, maybe that's, in, I don't know. It just seems to me that as if we have $5 million deficit in the Game and Fish Fund that we're spending a lot of money on uh, replacing seedlings and resolving well interferences when maybe we could direct that towards uh, something that we know is coming in the future. So that's, that's a comment on that. And then as far as FTEs, I guess, Mr. Chair, maybe I could take uh, Senator Lang's second question there while um, Ms. Robinson is looking up the FTEs. So I think, um, Senator Lang, part of your question is th this is a supplemental budget request, which is different than the, you know, the biennial budget request that uh, we would have addressed last year. And so many of the, the items that you're talking about that would fall under Game and Fish, those are ongoing needs. These are primarily one-time uh, funds that we have to invest. So we're prioritizing them to things that can be addressed with one-time funds in terms of um, looking ahead to what uh, we need to do with the Game and Fish Fund. We're addressing that through through a different mechanism that would be more ongoing. And so one way we look at that is is by looking at our license fee structure, certainly. Uh, and so I, you know, we may be back in a biennial budget with that. Um, the other, the other element that we're looking at is um, a separate initiative to really look at what what do we need on an ongoing basis um, to manage the state's outdoor recreation experiences and, and conservation needs sustainably and in a forward-looking way. And so we've been uh, getting input from Minnesotans on that, and then we will um, later this year have some recommendations uh, for the legislature and others on what we would suggest for sustainable funding going forward. But that is separate uh, from the, the supplemental budget package. Mr. Chair, I, I, would, I, would, I appreciate the fact that you only have maybe one thing that stretches out to 2025 in this, but you do have the opportunity as an agency. You don't have to worry about supplanting or uh, worry about that. That's what a supplemental budget would be for, is to fulfill your holes in the budget you currently have. Um, maybe not, and this is the MPCA. When you guys get up, you probably have a little more issue when it goes to carrying stuff on into three years down the road in the supplemental budget, but um, this this, uh, there's a lot of new programs in here that we hadn't thought about or talked about prior to, and if we have holes in the budget for next year, uh, 
maybe we should be a little forward looking, leaning forward and say, hey, we can fill these holes now. Let's do it uh, and prepare for 2023. That's fair. Um, and, and I think, I, sh you know, it, it seems to me, too, that, you know, it is not a budget year. And, and uh, the supplemental budget coming forward obviously reflects the, uh, you know, the surplus, I'm sure, uh, has, has somewhat to do with that. And uh, I'm certainly not going to sit here and say these aren't needs that have to be done. Uh, but these are, uh, some of these were, I think, brought forward to us last year and, and uh, were turned down. Uh, However, let's remember that anything, uh, anything one time is, is, is one issue, but anything that we fund ongoing uh, continues. And that takes a little more of a discussion. And then we start talking about FTEs. So were you ready to answer the question? Uh, yes, thank you, yeah. Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, related to FTEs, um, we can follow up and provide full FTE information if you're interested, but with regard to the drought uh, proposals, there was no, there are no FTEs associated with, for example, the well interference uh, proposal that we were discussing. Can you get, you, you'll have to try and get the microphone I'm a little, little closer. I'm sorry, Mr. There Chair. Is that better? That's much okay. better. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the committee, what I was saying was um, we can certainly follow up with FTE information if the committee is interested. I understood the question to be in regards to the drought proposals, especially the um, well interference and there are no FTEs associated with those proposals. And, and Mr. Chairman, we should just clarify, I just meant in general, if, if, if this is a supplemental budget, is it ongoing spending? Is it if we hire 100 people to, to do a job, uh, is that are those temporary employees, is it something where the state's gonna go away from that? And, uh, or is it an ongoing spending? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I believe the commissioner had already mentioned, but I'll reiterate that this is a supplemental budget year and therefore the spending proposed here is uh, one time rather than ongoing. And so in terms of FTE, we have temporary FTEs associated with these proposals um, and very, very limited um, new FTEs associated with the proposals as well when we can get you exact numbers. And Mr. Chair, I might just add to that, Commissioner. Senator Lang. Um, Again, I, I appreciate your comment about the budget needs. One of our most significant needs that, that we've been in front of this committee talking about is those, those frankly, those one-time investments in modernizing and refreshing our infrastructure. Our fish hatcheries were built in the 1950s, and much of that equipment is still being used today. So that's why we're here asking for that one-time investment in our fish hatcheries. Mm -hmm. Our public water accesses date back you know, to the 19. Uh, 50s and 60s, many of them, and so that's there. The only ongoing spending uh, that we have uh, in this supplemental budget relates to the governor's proposal on expanding broadband and relates to staff that are needed to process uh, broadband license applications. Everything else is, is one time or temporary. Mm -hmm. Senator Lang, follow up. Uh, well, I, I appreciate that fact, and I think that uh, the LCC Mar is a great place uh, where we can start talking about some of these things, and especially one-time proposals like that for infrastructure, where um, I'd love to see those proposals in LCC Mar, Mr. Chair. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think Legacy would be a better place, actually. So, so anyway. um, I know she's not listening. So, um, yeah, I would like to see if if there are. You know the temporary numbers as well as the uh, ongoing uh, FTEs. Uh, that's going to be the first question when we get together in a caucus uh, with our members. Is not only with these departments under the, under the purview of this committee, but everybody. So uh, we'll we'll really need that uh, fairly quickly mm -hmm. if you can, and would appreciate that. Any other questions, uh, Senator Icorn? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, for being here. Um, my question is around the um, $24 million appropriation for acquisition of public lands. Um, I know currently there's many other sources for acquisition of public lands, whether it be legacy funds, again, Senator Rood, or critical habitat, or bonding, or LCCMR. I'm just wondering, you know, why general fund money is needed for more public land acquisition at this time? And then I will probably have a follow-up, Mr. Chair. Commissioner. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator Eichhorn, 
Um, the, the reason um, for this being in this particular supplemental budget package is the emphasis on climate and the fact that we can uh, help mitigate greenhouse gas emissions by uh, acquiring and then managing those lands for carbon storage. You're absolutely correct uh, that we do use those other funding sources, um, primarily uh, legacy and, and the critical habitat funds. It, it does not mean that those funds meet the total uh, need that we have and the opportunity that we see today. Mr. Chair. Follow up. So my other question would be like, what kind of lands are being purchased for public? Is it for public use? Is it, you said you're, they're gonna be used for a specific purpose. If you can elaborate on that a little more, that would be helpful. The other thing I'd be interested in is if as you guys are looking at acquisition of new public lands, are you looking about other areas of the state? Because I know when I look at my communities, we're pretty stretched out as far as what our counties can handle in public lands. We already have, you know, up to 80% of the lands in some of my counties off the tax roll, and the PILT is inadequate to cover the tax base loss that they have. So is there any thought being given to, if you're gonna purchase more public lands, purchasing in other parts of the state, because I know my counties are hurting as far as that's concerned. We all love our public lands, we all want more, but there needs to be something done a little different, I think, because Again, the, the, the counties are hurting as far as tax base goes, at least in northern Minnesota. So if you could elaborate on both those, I would appreciate it. Commissioner. Mr. Chair and Senator Eichhorn, absolutely. I'm happy to elaborate on that. In terms of the types of land um, that we would uh, acquire, it would be mostly for wildlife management area purposes, um, perhaps uh, to a smaller extent, scientific and natural area if we have lands that qualify. And then the, the final uh, category would be in, uh, state park in holdings, uh, if those become available. Um, we acquire uh, lands through our strategic land asset management approach, and that really does ensure that we work very closely with counties to make sure, um, one, that we are acquiring those lands that are most strategic for the state of Minnesota to own and for the DNR to manage in the way that, that we propose uh, to manage them for the benefit of the public. And um, so I, I would just share that the vast majority of our acquisition is not happening um, in your part of the state. It is, it is happening uh, primarily in other parts of the state where there is not uh, the robust extent of, of public lands. It doesn't mean there aren't any, I will be clear, but that is not the, the primary place where acquisition is happening. Thank you, and, and uh, Senator Dibble, I'll go to you, but to this point, I, <clears throat> I, I would like to ask the commissioner, uh, every year we have a lands bill or I think it's every year, uh, where the uh, state of Minnesota sells land, actually uh, sells land that's compromised or, uh, you know, okay. sprawl is, is happening and uh, no longer will the habitat uh, be able to utilize the land. And uh, maybe somebody can give me an idea, on the average, how many acres do we sell a year and how many more acres I mean, this is really kind of a shot in the dark here, but how many more acres uh, are purchased, say, in a two-year period versus how many are sold uh, during the lands bill? You know, do you have any idea? Some of that is, I know, close to state parks. Uh, give me an idea. Mr. Chair, I don't know, if, if Assistant Commissioner Meyer, if you have numbers. I will just Mr. say... Quickly though, as, as the approach, our strategic land asset management is the framework both through which we acquire lands, we sell lands, and we uh, exchange lands. And so, you know, we are always trying to manage that port land portfolio in a, in a dynamic fashion. But I, do you have information on the numbers? Mr. Chair, I, we will get you the numbers. I just want to highlight something that we talked about in Senator Rood's committee yesterday, selling land online using the mid-bid process. We did a pilot project two years ago Last year, we were very successful. Most all of our parcels sold above appraised value, and we had a lot more bidders. So we're looking at ways to, to dispose of land easier uh, and get more return for the dollars. Um, it's not a, a equal, we sell the same amount as we, as we purchase, but certainly we work with uh, individuals, local units of government, and counties on, as the commissioner said, our strategic land asset management program and identify parcels for disposition and for acquisition through that phase. So, so the question I would have is, uh, uh, I'm a private landowner and I, I go along a, a state park that seems to go on and on and on endless amounts of miles. And 
in, in my view, as, as a, as a taxpaying person, how do I go about inquiring even? Uh, you know, I'd like to buy 40 or I'd like to buy 50 acres of that. How do I even, how does the public do that? Because I don't think they really know. Um, but does it have to come up for sale before they are able to even look at purchasing something like that? Mr. Chairman, members, it comes to us through a variety of different ways, oftentimes through local legislators. They'll contact us about their constituents' interests. Now, many types of land have strings attached. They have federal funding, LSOHC money, for example, Outdoor Heritage Fund, bonding dollars. We can't really sell bond land that has bond proceeds on it unless we pay those bonds off, things like that. But we do take it very seriously and try to be a good neighbor whenever possible and, and work with folks. Uh, we've done exchanges in the past. We've done sales. Sometimes in the lands bill, there's a directed sale to deal with a trespass that may have occurred inadvertently. And uh, we do take our land ownership responsibilities very seriously. Good. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, just wanted to respond quickly to Senator Eichhorn's uh, first question about why a proposal to purchase land with general fund money in light of um, other sources that we have through uh, either um, you know, LSA, OHC, or LCCMR, et cetera. And, and I would just um, mention to members and the, and the public who's listening um, that those dollars are intended to be um, supplemental um, over and above uh, what the DNR and, and other agencies would view as their um, you know, core responsibility and regular program. Um, and um, and that, we, that we shouldn't look to um, those sources as the place where DNR and other agencies would um, do all of their um, decision making and, uh, dec and, and deciding on whether to preserve land resources and the like. It's you know, quite explicitly um, an opportunity that the voters and the taxpayers of Minnesota gave us for a time limited 25 year period um, to, to kind of get ahead of the game to acquire and preserve natural areas that would otherwise um, not be uh, available to us because they would be they would be gone forever. Um, but that the agency should and the legislature should carry out the core and the crux of its of its key responsibilities in the meantime as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dribble. And that's that's exactly right. And I'm glad you brought that up. The supplanting issue always comes comes into play when you're talking about those constitutional amendment dollars. Uh, that we're actually uh, to, uh, to not to supplant or to supplant. And it's always the uh, big discussion we have and we continue, although I think we've done a very good job of, uh, you know, uh, fending off that, that, that whole attitude there. Occasionally we get locked up, but uh, overall it's been, a, it's been a tremendous opportunity for, for the environment. I think with that we're going uh, to end the, the DNR's presentation and go on to the time factor. And if you have any other questions, members of, of uh, either uh, anybody from the DNR, please get a hold of uh, one of the two of these uh, commissioners, uh, Commissioner Stroman or, or Meyer, and, and uh, get your questions answered. And, and uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here today and have the time. Thank you. Next, we'll call on presentation on CWD management, Mr. Uh, Mr. Meyer, I think you're going to probably take that. Mr. Chairman, I will stay at the podium if it's okay for questions. Actually, Dr. Kelly Straka is going to participate remotely and go through the slide deck that we have on CWD. Can you hear me this morning? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, fantastic. Okay. All right. Okay, good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I trust that you can hear me, and can you see me as well? Yeah, yes, we can. Please identify yourself and, and go ahead. Perfect. Um, let's get started here. All right, 
Mr. Chair, members of the committee, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Kelly Straka. I am the Wildlife Section Manager for the Minnesota DNR. I'm here to give you a little bit of a, an update on where we're at with chronic wasting disease. I do appreciate the time, so I will go right into it. However, um, I wanted to, to let you know a couple of things. One, I cannot see you or see myself for that matter right now. So this is a little bit like talking into an abyss. So if at any time you need me to stop, please just interrupt. Again, I can't see anything. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through this presentation. We are in fact in a brave new world with these remote meetings. One other thing is I am hoping, I'm, I'm sorry I'm not there in person today. I really had hoped to be. I'm on my way up north uh, to Red Lake WMA to meet with our field staff up there. So either way, I'm hoping again that I will be able to attend in person if you'd like to speak with me again at any time. So with that, I will move on. Can you see my first slide now? I should say the top overview of CWD surveillance plan. Yes, we can. Lovely. All right, so this is where we were, we were sitting going into fall 2021 with our CWD surveillance. Um, n at no point in this, in this presentation do I actually go into what CWD is or anything like that. This is just an update. Again, I'm happy to provide any information if, if that conversation is needed. But moving into fall of 2021, this is what we were looking at for our surveillance for chronic wasting disease across the state. We did have six different areas. Those six areas are broken into three different zones. I know this gets complicated quickly. So again, we can, we can talk more in depth if we need to. Uh, we have management zones, control zones, and surveillance zones. So you can see where we were at. Uh, these are color coded. Hopefully that comes across on your screen. All of our areas had mandatory sampling over the opening weekend of firearms A and B seasons, with the exception of a couple of areas right in that west central part of the state. Uh, we refer to them as DPAs 213 and 273. That's that Douglas County area. Over there, we were doing something a little bit different, piloting a, a point scheme, in other words, a, a weighted sampling approach to really figure out how we can improve our surveillance and be more efficient with our resources. So in addition to the six areas across the state, you'll see the uh, management and control zones that are in orange and yellow on this map. In addition to that mandatory testing, we did have voluntary self-service sampling stations available during all of the hunting seasons, as well as dumpsters to accommodate uh, carcass movement and disposal, which I'll be talking about in a few slides. The surveillance zones that are all in gray on the map also had appointments available for hunters to get deer tested outside of that opening window framework. And again, we went into the surveillance season expecting around 22,000, 22,500 samples with a total anticipated cost of the surveillance right around 2 million. Where we are at, um, as, of, uh, as of the end of this season, since July 1st of 2021, we've tested nearly 15,000 samples. So again, not quite as high as we thought we were going to get, but, but certainly a fair number of samples have been tested. Of those 15,000 samples, 31 new detections of chronic wasting disease were found. Now, where we're sitting in terms of expenditures for this cost or for the surveillance is about $1.38 million in expenses so far. But please keep in mind that many of our invoices are still continuing to come in from the fall, and we are actually doing additional management actions in the late season, as well as going on right now. Um, so some of those costs will still be coming in. We won't have final numbers for a few months yet. Um, when we talk a little bit about our staff and, and personnel resources that were used, 224 DNR staff did work over 21,600 hours um, to help with this surveillance. So it certainly is a significant uh, impact to our staff and definitely an investment of their time. We also utilized, and this is one of my favorite things about, about these projects and something that I've been involved in uh, since I was a student actually in undergrad, uh, we used 184 students from over 13 colleges and universities across the state. And I think that's a really interesting partnership and certainly opportunities that the students look forward to and a chance for us to get to know those folks and hopefully um, pull them into working with us in the future, which is great. I did want to focus as part of this, this talk today a little bit on just one area in particular. I do have slides like this for the other six areas that we talked about. Uh, if we do want to go into detail, but the reason I highlighted our southeast management and control zone is because it's certainly where we're seeing the, the area of persistent infection or where we are finding positives over time. Certainly a lot of testing has been done in this area and that will be ongoing. So when I mentioned in a, a couple of slides ago that we had 31 new cases of CWD identified in free ranging deer across the state, 27 of those were found in the southeast management zone. 
So certainly this is our area of greatest concern for that persistent infection. You can see here on the map, the red and the blue dots are, are basically identifying what year those positives were identified and their approximate location. All of the background sort of sort of you know noise that almost just looks like all those little background dots, those are locations of other deer that were tested for CWD, but those results have been not detected. So again, this is certainly our biggest area of concern for ongoing infection. Which brings us to what are we doing about that? You know, one of the things I, I like to highlight with people is when we start talking about chronic waves and disease, surveillance is very important. We have to use surveillance as our best tool to inform management, but it is not in and of itself management. Just testing for a disease, looking for a disease is going to do nothing to, to impact the trajectory of that disease on the landscape. So what we really have to do is, is company that with management, right? And, and our management here in the state really looks like going in around those areas where we have identified positive cases and doing a localized removal of deer. Now what, that can be phenomenally challenging, um, not only for landowners, but also for hunters, right? And, and nobody wants to see by any means any deer populations eradicated because of the disease. So it does have to be a pretty focal effort. When we find the disease, we know it's on the landscape at this location. We need to do the best we can to remove additional positive deer that might be in that same local area. So with that, we do um, some winter work after our seasons have closed. We do offer those late season disease management hunts. That certainly is true here in the Southeast Management Zone. We also utilize landowner shooting permits. Now these are open to landowners, private landowners that are in, again, uh, you can kind of see the, the squares of areas. Those are, those are um, sections, so they're one mile areas that we will actually focus some of these removals. So landowners in those areas are eligible to have shooting permits. Those are no cost to them. We do send out letters to them every year and ask landowners if they'd like to participate. That helps again, give landowners in that area um, opportunity to harvest additional deer and really help us with disease control efforts. After that, after that landowner shooting permit period, that's where we will use localized um, agency calling as a veterinarian. I struggle with calling. I know a lot of our hunters struggle with calling, but again, we really do calling in a focal area to try to remove more positive animals and prevent the spread of this disease. Uh, per our CWD management and response plan, these are the management actions that really are the best tools that we have uh, to impact and or to, to mitigate the spread of this disease on the landscape. We start talking about what kind of impact is it having? This is in full transparency, what we're seeing for apparent prevalence with both the Fillmore County outbreak and the Winona County outbreak. So down in that Southeast zone again, you will see that we have seen slight increases in prevalence over time. But if you look at that, the Y axis, right? If you look at the, the prevalence levels we're dealing with, prevalence being the amount of deer that are on the landscape that are positive um, out of all of the deer on the landscape. So we use apparent prevalence because obviously we're not testing or harvesting all the deer on the landscape. So this is going to be the subset of deer that we test that are positive. That apparent prevalence, um, if you look at the scale of that, it's relatively low intervals, right? So we're not seeing increases in the amount of disease from 1% of the deer to 5% of the deer to 20% of the deer testing positive. That certainly is what we're seeing in other states. We're not seeing it here in Minnesota. We're seeing very, very gradual um, and, and still less than we're right around that 1% prevalence level. So certainly I think we're sitting better than a lot of other states. We are not negative. You know, we do know we have the disease and we're going to have to deal with that. But our management is keeping and maintaining those prevalence levels pretty well. One thing I wanted to highlight because it did come up um, this year, uh, we did have a hunter in fall of, of 2021, so it was right in early November. Yeah, um, a hunter did absolutely everything right. And this is one of those stories where I, I, I've worked with this disease in a long time. And, and one of the things you hope for is that hunters can understand what you're asking of them. And this individual did a phenomenal job. He did everything absolutely right. He did submit his own sample for CWD screening. Um, and, and this was an adult male deer that deer did come back positive. Now that was our first detection of CWD in Polk County. You can see in the map on the left, it's pretty close to that North Dakota border. So we did go ahead and do surveillance in that area this fall. Um, we collected about 240 or 238 samples on the Minnesota side of the border. 
um, a chunk of those, 84 of them, were within 15 miles of that positive. So you can see, again, the dots on the map are showing where those harvested deer were, were collected. Um, and none of the deer that we tested came back positive. Now, on the other side <coughs> of the border, because apparently, no matter how hard you tell them, deer do not respect political boundaries. So we did have a number of deer that were tested by North Dakota on their side of the border. Unfortunately, we don't know the exact locations of those deer. We just know that 92 were harvested in that in that hunt area of theirs. It's called Hunt Unit 2B. They did collect 92 samples and all 92 were not detected for CWD. So I did want to talk a little bit moving away from specific areas <coughs> in the landscape. We'll talk a little bit. I'm sorry, did I get a question? Uh, no, that was a cough, actually, but I do have a question now that I, we got you on pause here. <laughs> and sure, there's another one. <laughs> there's another one, but I can't come up with two questions. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> when you're talking about the one in Polk County there, do you have any idea what's your, what's your feeling as to where that one deer came from? That's an excellent question, Mr. Chair. So the, the question of, of where that deer came from, we don't. And so one of the challenges that I have looking at the landscape there is that we do know this is, um, this is a pretty good river corridor. And one thing we know about adult male deer in particular, especially during that rut, they do what adult male, male deer and well and yearling deer, male deer do too, you know, they they move. And so we do know that they um, we do know that they can move rather long distances, especially further rut in the fall. And so that's the hard thing when you have an adult male, you're not entirely sure was that male there for very long? Was he just passing through doing his, you know, male deer business? So what we want to do is really focus surveillance. And that's one of the reasons when we get an adult male deer, in particular, even a yearling male, when we find a CWD positive deer, the question is, where did it come from? And that's a really hard way to know. Female deer have a little bit more sight fidelity. They don't like to move as far. Um, so with those male, that's where we really focus our, our surveillance and try to do more testing and figure out, are there more positive deer in that area? One thing about this disease in particular, I'll just say, is um, the first case that you find is very, very rarely the first case of the disease in the area. So in this situation, you know, did that deer come across from the border? Didn't it travel down a, a river valley? We, we don't know. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Great, of course, thank you. So a little bit about our dumpster program. We did deploy uh, dumpsters at 32 sites this fall. These were only available in CWD management and control zones. And that's basically those zones are identifying where we've identified the disease in the wild, right? And these areas are also gonna have carcass movement restrictions in place. We do also have landfill options in our surveillance zones. And so hunters certainly can work on practicing proper carcass disposal. Um, one of the additional challenging things about this disease, because it is full of many challenging things, um, is that we know that the, the agent that causes the disease can get in the environment. And I'm sure you've heard about this before, but it can get in the environment. So practicing proper carcass disposal is extremely important. And so that's why one of these reasons why we use landfills across the state to give hunters, you know, basically a way to dispose of those carcasses properly and safely. Now you'll see down in the bottom left of this slide, um, about 58% of, of the carcasses that, the CWD positive carcasses that we know of um, were properly disposed of, 58% of those were put in landfills. So this is definitely a great program and something that we would like to continue and even improve upon in the future. So moving on from carcass disposal, this is another, this is another pretty important topic and this can be extremely challenging for, for hunters as you know, I'm, I'm a hunter myself. And so this can be a, a hard one but we do look at deer feeding and attracted bands as an important tool to prevent, uh, ideally prevent new introductions of the disease to an area where it does not exist, but also mitigate some of the spread of the disease where it does exist. So when you look at this, um, following our results, uh, surveillance results from 2021, the deer feeding ban, the recommendation was put to expand it to include a total of 44 counties. So when you look at this map, it's a pretty fair proportion of our state that is now um, underneath some level of deer feeding ban or feeding and attractant ban. And so you can see certainly there's four different um, areas, if you will, delineated with different hash marks or solid colors on the map. So you can see where these new areas were added. Obviously that Beltrami, Itasca, Northern, North Central area was, um, was recommended following the detection of CWD in a captive deer facility in Beltrami County. And then again, we talked about the, the, full, or the Polk County um, deer that tested positive. And so those two new areas have been added. 
we add each county and each county that um, surrounds the county where CWD has been detected. So again, you'll see that this is a pretty wide swath across the state of Minnesota that is now going to be under deer feeding or feeding an attractive game. One other thing, this is um this is something really positive that I'm 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 proud of the state for putting this into place, and I think uh, certainly we're we're setting the stage for other states to do something similar. When we start talking about agency calling, that is a, a very challenging topic to talk about, and I I realize that I can appreciate that, but we can we can take that important tool and make the best out of it. And so we have the program called Share the Harvest. All deer from our agency calling efforts does go to the public. Anyone can sign up for this on the website. The website's here on your slide. So the meat will come packaged in cuts as loin, roast, and trim. And so this is a first come, first serve donation list. Um, all of those animals are tested first for CWD. Only deer with a not detected test result will be distributed. Again, I think this is a really important program that we can we can utilize to get uh, an important protein source back to our families across the state. So looking ahead, um, certainly we're wrapping up uh, our fall 2021 surveillance totals, really understanding what, what, what we have on the landscape right now. We are going to be looking at that risk-based model. I talked about that a little bit in that Douglas County area. So that's our DPAs 273 and 213 where we're looking at different ways to utilize surveillance, again, to make sure that we're sticking to sound surveillance from an epidemiologic standpoint, but also that we're being cost-effective with our resources. So we will be summarizing some of that. Um, that pilot that I mentioned again in those two DPAs is set to go for one more year, so we will be doing that. Our draft recommendations for fall 2022 surveillance efforts, um, this is all being discussed right now, but again, our CWD footprint is going to be expanded to seven areas with that addition of the Polk County area. We will be determining our sampling goals, our framework for surveillance. Uh, we are already engaging in conversations on how to expand our hunter service testing. Uh, and what I mean by that is certainly we start using, we start talking about our primary goal of surveillance is to find the disease, find it early, and to continue monitoring that prevalence over time. So that's really what we're looking at. But there's a, a whole nother aspect that I don't think should be ignored at all is those hunters across the state that might not be in an area where we are actively looking for the disease or we think there's a risk there. Hunters across the state would like to have their deer tested and how do we facilitate that? So we're certainly looking at ways to expand that to make it as cost effective as possible. Um, and that's gonna be something that I really, I hope we can build on for, for 2022. Again, we're also moving forward with our rule development, our hunting regulations, our staffing plans. All of these conversations are in progress right now. We have started a CWD after action review with our staff to better get a handle on what worked well this season, what didn't, as well as we are open for public comment right now on all of our deer season goal setting. So um, all those public comment opportunities are going on right now. I think the public has about one more week to weigh in and we have a series of webinars on, on what we're doing with our deer goal populations overall. So. With that, I think that's that's it. I'm gonna to try to uh, escape out of this so I can at least see you lovely individuals and I'm absolutely happy to take any questions. Thank you uh, for that presentation. And I th I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of questions in the future, if not today. I don't know, are there any, uh, any senators that have any questions? Senator Eaton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is um, on a little different subject, I guess. I've been reading several articles about uh, the deer carrying the coronavirus, COVID, and I'm wondering if uh, anything's been um, studied or tested on that, and if the Department of Health has uh, been involved. Ms. Drucker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Eaton. Yes, yeah, so I believe research was done actually through the University of Minnesota, and I think they recently issued a press release about that. Um, the Department of Health was working with the University of Minnesota to look for what's called SARS-CoV-2. It's the virus that causes COVID-19 in people. They certainly did look at deer across the state of Minnesota and, and test them for the presence of that virus. Uh, I cannot remember the numbers offhand, but there were a proportion of deer that were found to be positive for that virus. Now, what we don't know is what that means. And I know the University of Minnesota is engaging on additional studies to better understand that. Just to be clear, there are a number of states that have been looking for SARS-CoV-2, especially in white-tailed deer. It has been found in states. Iowa put forth quite a lot of information about this, as did Wisconsin. 
Um, I came here this past fall from Michigan. Michigan was doing surveillance for the virus as well. So we know, in fact, that wildlife obviously are exposed to these viruses. We now know that they can be infected with these viruses. What we don't know is, can they sustain the virus in their own populations? And is there any chance of spill back into people? And that's what the University of Minnesota is certainly looking at. Um, Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, has, has, have they shown any symptoms of the disease or are they just carriers? Ms. Drucker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Yes, yeah, so, so the research that we know of has been done uh, through USDA in a captive study. They've actually done some laboratory studies where these animals were not shown, um, did not display any symptoms. So they did not look sick, but they were able to find the virus being shed um, from those infected animals. And so again, they don't look sick, they don't appear sick, at least to the best of our knowledge. There's never been a report that I know of of sick deer on the landscape that have tested positive for the virus. So again, it's, it's hard to know if, if, you know, a deer coughs in the woods, unlike, sorry, Mr. Chair, you know, when you coughed earlier, I, I don't know if the deer are coughing in the woods, but, but certainly what we do know from laboratory studies is they did not show any symptoms at the time. Thank you. Senator Dibble. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Straka, uh, just, a, just a kind of a kind of a big question, if you will. Um, is CWD here to stay? Um, are we just in a mode of trying to manage it, manage it as best we can? Or do we think with uh, intense and intentional efforts, we might be able to eliminate or eradicate it for the most part? What, how, how should we be thinking about this as a state, as policymakers and the like? Ms. Straka. Mr. Chair, Senator Dibble, thank you for that question. And this is one of those where I wish I could. I'm a, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm, I'm an optimist. I am. I'm an eternal optimist. I know this. Um, this is where I would love to say, no, we're good. I, I'm here to tell you that CWD um, is likely here to stay in Minnesota. So the, the challenge is going to become when we know, when we talk about that Southeast management zone that I talked about on a few slides that is likely to stay the infection is likely to be here now what we can do again is continuing our pretty aggressive efforts to maintain that disease and keep it from getting outside of the area where it currently exists and certainly try to keep that prevalence as low as we can i think our efforts to date have been successful we've been doing a good job at that and again coming here from another state minnesota is looked at as a model for a lot of these management efforts now, the, the challenge for us and the key for us in perpetuity will be preventing new introductions elsewhere in the state. And where we have found some of these more isolated cases, if you look up at um, permit area 604, which is up in that Crow Wing County area, we've identified the disease now twice. Two separate, two separate animals, that was it. And we've tested a lot of deer in that area. I wanna say right around 15,000. So we're confident that there's not a big established focus of disease but certainly the fact that we found it means we need to continue that surveillance. If we can find the disease early enough and implement good management actions, yes, I think we can locally eliminate the disease. But for those areas of persistent infection where we've shown that the, the animals, you know, we've got ongoing transmission, I, I think we have to move from a mindset of eradication much more to how do we prevent this from getting worse. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Uh, members, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for that. I'm sure uh, this will not be the last uh, last time we visit uh, with regards to this. Uh, uh, we had a meeting yesterday. I know the Ag Committee is getting involved in this with the Board of Animal Health, and, and uh, uh, hopefully we're going to get some some resolve and some some organization going there to to try and manage this uh, this disease. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have uh, the. MPCA agency supplement budget request. Oh my goodness, they work quick. They're already here. You want to be efficient. Well, either you work quick or I'm pretty long winded, but we'll go with the <laughs> long winded thing. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself. And I know we're, we're, we're stretched on time, but we'll get as far as we can and maybe we can finish up uh, tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just making sure you can see my screen.
Great, Mr. Chair uh, and members, thank you for the opportunity to be here. For the record, I'm Katrina Kessler, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency Commissioner. With me is Assistant Commissioner Kirk Kadelka. We also have Assistant Commissioner Craig McDonald, as members, as well as members of our legislative staff and fiscal staff. And we will try to be as concise as possible, but also here to answer questions. Um, I think it's always helpful to ground ourselves in the same starting place, so I've shown the MPCA mission here to protect and improve human health and the environment. As you will hear, our supplemental budget recommendations are rooted in three general themes, specifically utilizing the one-time surplus dollars to help local communities address and understand risks posed by the perfluoral or forever PFAS chemicals. Second, adapt to more extreme weather events. And third, support local communities in their efforts to foster healthy environment and vibrant economies. So I'm gonna go through the water proposals and then hand it off to Assistant Commissioner Kadelka. So the first proposal, and I've got the FTE up here that um, Senator Lang and Chair Ingebrigtsen were asking about, and we can certainly follow up with more on this if people are interested. The first proposal recognizes that Minnesota communities, again, are facing increasing pressures to adapt to extreme weather events, and that there are significant gaps available in the current funding levels to protect community space and public infrastructure. This proposal would provide grants for communities to plan, design, and implement preparedness projects. This is a complement to the Board of Water and Soil Resources $15 million water storage proposal. These funds would be available for five years, and that includes the FTE shown up there for the span of those five years, and part of the reason that we are expanding the availability of these funds is to match and leverage bipartisan infrastructure legis or funds that are coming through the, the investment through the federal government at this point. And the FTE on the slide for those five years would be at the MPCA to help efficiently and effective delivery of that, those funds and provide technical assistance. The second proposal also recognizes that planning and optimization and design may be necessary at the local level to get ready to maximize, again, additional federal funds coming to the state via that bipartisan infrastructure law that are slated to come through the state revolving fund to the public, affiliate, public facilities authority that is managed jointly by the MPCA. Eligible work for these funds include evaluating treatment options, identifying cost-effective solutions, and exploring innovative permitting approaches. And I will call out, Mr. Chair, that the work done by ALISD related to phosphorus and chloride is the type of work that would be eligible for these types of funds. The next two proposals are designed are also designed to provide additional resources and data to communities looking to address PFAS. Eligible activities for the community grants include monitoring at wastewater and solid waste facilities, identifying and minimizing upstream sources, and disposing of PFAS containing, containing firefighting foam. The, the baseline study up there would help us determine what normal levels of PFAS are, whether that's in water or soil, so that we could actually focus state and, again, federal infrastructure dollars that we see coming down the pike to at the greatest areas of concern. The next proposal simply extends the availability of last session's legislative appropriation for one fiscal year to allow the MPCA to engage in extensive in, in engagement and stakeholder work with partners so that we can produce a mercury TMDL or total maximum daily load for the St. Louis River that has robust support across state, tribal, federal government, and academic partners. The next proposal is designed to ensure that there is a sustainable funding source for our, our smart salting training program. As you may know, the, currently the MPCA offers this certification class at no charge to attendees, and that is supplemented by the Clean Water Fund and Environment and Natural Resource, Environment and Natural Resource Trust Funds, which we know are not sustainable, as we've already discussed today. I want to thank Senator Rood for her introduction of a bill that has a companion in the House that would allow the agency to charge this fee. And the last two items on this are purely policy items. The first would require communities to notify downstream uh, water suppliers as well as downstream public when they have a discharge of partially or untreated wastewater. And the second would allow a municipality to request a waiver to a currently required 30-day pre-public notice of a wastewater permit for construction so that they could move faster through the bidding process and take advantage of um, 
a shorter construction season in Minnesota and, and, and opportunities to get better prices. So at this point, I can turn it over to Assistant Con Commissioner Kadelka. Commissioner, welcome. Chair and committee members, thank you. My name is Kirk Kadelka. I'm an Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And I'll quickly go through the land and waste proposals. So the first one is an infusion of dollars in the Minnesota uh, solid waste system through one-time grants in four areas. It would be for preventing wasted food and food rescue grants, recycling market development facility development grants, compost and anaerobic digestion facility development and expansion grants, and finally, sustainable building and materials management grants. While we've been doing a good job, uh, many are doing good jobs, we still recycle less than half of what we create. And this effort would help achieve the environmental jobs and also other social, social benefits in these areas. The next item is the agency's operating increase. This proposal is to help our land programs, our support and operating functions at the agency maintain recent staff and service levels. Like last year's water and air adjustments, the land programs so, and support functions assist local governments, small businesses, uh, permittees, and others through technical assistance, permitting support, and financial support. This would allow for us to continue to maintain existing service levels in these areas and not create backlogs. The next item is creating a community-based brownfield grants program. This is a one-time funding of $1 million. This would provide funding for cleaning up, for investigation and cleanup plans at sites identified by communities in underserved areas of Minnesota. Often brownfield development is driven by market forces and economic developments, leaving out vacant lots and missed opportunities. This would allow for these important, important first steps so many community projects can get off on the right foot and help them leverage additional funding. The next item is railroad safety, and this is maintaining a current FTE of worth of positions. Under Minnesota Statute 115E, the emergency response and preparedness and spill provisions, the MPCA is responsible for reviewing railroads emergency response capabilities, plans, and overseeing their responses when we talk about spills that impact human health and the environment. Public safety issues in that are dealt by other agencies, but we're responsible for those impacts that have things impact such as surface water or drinking water. Previously, this was funded by the Railroad and Pipeline Safety Account, which no longer has funds in it due to a funding source expiring in 2017, and we like to keep these existing positions to carry out these duties. The next is a connected to a policy initi initiative. This would expand restrictions on two toxins that caused negative long-term health impacts <clears throat> so that we would strengthen the lead and cadmium restrictions in toys and jewelry and expand it to other items to help protect pregnant women and children. And these are items that we have seen lead and cadmium in other states reporting. This would provide uh, staff ongoing, uh, half staff to do this into the future too. The next is connected to our capital assistance program, also referred to as CAP. This is a bonding program. We're proposing policy changes to this, including increasing the amount of dollars eligible for local units of government from two million cap per county per project to $5 million. This requires a small rulemaking change to have our rules conform with the statutory changes, and that is what the funding is for there. The next is for a solar panel product stewardship proposal. The actual um, operation of a program to reuse, recycle, and properly dispose of discarded solar panels would be funded through manufacturers, but there are some oversight responsibilities for the state agencies agencies would build the product stewardship organization that is created to operate this manufacturer-led program, and this provides a financial mechanism for that to, for the agency to cover its costs. The next is creating uniform tools for Brownfield's redevelopment program. Our Brownfield program is split into two different subgroups. One is Petroleum Brownfield program, and the other is the Voluntary Investigation Cleanup program. Think of non-petroleum hazardous substances. Currently, the Petroleum Remediation Brownfield Program uh, has a system where we have a revolving fund, so a portion of the annual in invoice revenues go to that fund to support administrative costs. This would create it for our VIC program also. And finally, a small savings uh, policy proposal to reduce from two times a year to once, a report on the 3M Natural Resources Damage Settlement, and that is the last item, and I will, Mr. Chair and committee members, pass it back to Commissioner Kessler. 
So the last item that we have for you today would provide a one-time influx of resources to the MPCA Small Business Loan Program to spur economic development and reduce environmental impacts. The Small Business Environmental Loan Program provides zero interest loans of up to 75,000 for projects that meet or go beyond regulations to create healthier workforce, reduce waste and energy costs. And we've seen an increase in the interest from businesses in recent years in this program. So Mr. Chair and members of the committee, sorry to uh, rush through that, but I'm sensitive of the time and we're happy to answer questions and we have others here with us if, if uh, Assistant Commissioner Kadelka and I don't know the answers. I, well, thank both of you and I, and I know there's probably some questions, but uh, I think it's, it's uh, prudent that we, you know, we, we quit at the uh, quit time here and, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you're willing to come back and, and field those questions. I don't know, are, have you seen a lot of questions, members? Of members? I'm sure there's gonna be some, so instead of starting in, uh, if that would be okay, we would uh, add you to the, to the uh, uh, agenda for tomorrow. I, I don't think it would take too long, but I do have some questions as well, but that's gonna lead into a little bit more time, so. Okay, and certainly. I, we apologize, for, I, I think getting ready today ate up a lot of our time, and, and uh, but hopefully we'll get, uh, we'll get this all figured out. And, and uh, with that, um, members, we stand adjourned until tomorrow.